I'm like many people who insist on owning automotive toys. This restored 1969 Jaguar XKE is my seventh sports car, and it took me about a year to find it back in 1979. Buying an older used sports car is a little like buying a used airplane, but with a few notable differences. One of the primary ones is that a mistake in selecting the wrong airplane can cost you a lot more than money. Certainly, mechanical condition is important in a used sports car, but that and a number of other factors can dramatically affect the success of a used plane purchase decision. I bought this little Turbo Mooney Executive about five years ago, and perhaps coincidentally, like the XKE, it's also a 1969 model, old enough to vote. Over the last 20 years, I've owned a succession of six airplanes, and only one of them was new. A good used airplane can represent an excellent investment, not only in terms of fun and utility, but financially as well. The very fact that you're watching this tape suggests you must be seriously interested in purchasing a used airplane. Choosing the right airplane and deciding how much to spend for it is a much tougher job, however. Do you need a high wing or a low wing? Should you buy a fixed gear or a retractable? How many seats do you really need? Two, four, or six? Is turbocharging important, or will normal aspiration do? Should you spring for an airplane with an already full panel, or buy a sparsely equipped machine and add avionics as necessary? It's best to answer all these questions before you go out looking for an airplane. Logic will dictate most of the answers, but keep in mind that many pilots buy more airplane than they need. They buy more seats than they'll use, purchase more complexity than they can support, and generally buy over their heads. Today, we're going to look at all these considerations, examine the used plane model selection process, and give you some tips on finding the right airplane for you. If you've decided you're definitely going to buy an airplane, your first consideration will be which type best suits your needs. The question of high wing or low wing could be much more important than you might think. A high wing has an obvious advantage in ground clearance, but that's not normally a major consideration unless you operate consistently in the boondocks. If you're considering camping under the wing, a high wing also has the edge in terms of both shade and comfort. Visit an air show sometime and you'll see the advantages. There's little difference between high wings and low wings in systems integrity and safety, though a high wing does have minor benefits. Because most airplanes carry fuel in wing tanks, and a high wing airplane places those tanks well above the engine, fuel flow is less likely to be interrupted by a failure of the engine driven pump. Virtually all low wings use a backup electric fuel pump as a hedge against pump failure. And many of the simpler high wing airplanes, such as 150 Skyhawks in this Skylane behind me, don't need the second pump. Conversely, many pilots favor the convenience and in flight visibility of a low wing. Fueling is almost universally easier with a low wing, and the pre-flight process is so much simpler, there's less chance of a pilot skipping the visual fuel check. While it's true you can't see the ground directly below as well from a low wing, you won't lose sight of the airport during the base and final turns. Finally, many pilots feel that low wings are better looking, though the opposite camp argues that low wings are freaks because after all, there are no low wing birds. Choosing between a retractable and a fixed gear depends primarily on how much complexity and performance you're willing to pay for. Fixed gear models aren't bulletproof, but at least the gear is down and welded, so you won't ever have to worry about the wheels failing to extend. Most pilots don't operate from fields so rough that they damage a retractable's more delicate gear system, but there's no question a fixed gear airplane is better for even slightly rough fields. An obvious advantage of a retractable is better speed and climb with the underwing clean, but the difference may be less than you think. Good wheel pan and strut design can make up for much of the retractable's advantage. 
A 200 horsepower retractable Piper Arrow or Beach Sierra is only barely faster than a 180 horsepower fixed foot Grumman Tiger. Retractables are more expensive to insure and maintain, and they exact a higher pilot workload, but they do normally fly faster, are more efficient, and unquestionably, they're better looking in flight. The question of how many seats to buy depends totally on how many people you really need to carry. Quite often, single pilots without kids find that a simple two-seater is adequate. Those who buy four seats often find they rarely use the rear buckets in a four-place airplane. On the other hand, a four-seater can make a great two-place airplane with all the baggage space and allowance you could possibly ask for. Six seats are great if you truly have a need for them, but you'll normally pay a heavy penalty in terms of purchase price, fuel consumption, maintenance, and insurance to haul a six-pack of people through the sky. I can tell you from experience that turbocharging can be a very expensive feature to buy and maintain, but it does offer some solid performance advantages for those who can use it. This Turbo Mooney is my second airplane with a blower under the bonnet, but because much of my personal flying is in the high mountain west, I wouldn't be without a turbocharger. For my purposes, turbocharging gets me up out of the heat of summer quicker. It lifts me off high altitude fields with greater safety and allows me to cruise at 11,000 to 12,000 feet above the highest terrain and still maintain a full 75% power. If I need to top truly big clouds, I can usually do that too. The primary disadvantages of turbocharging are that the airplane is more expensive to buy, the engine normally runs hotter because of the heat of compression, engine TBO generally is reduced, fuel consumption increases, and maintenance is much more expensive. A final consideration in any purchase decision is how much avionics you really need. Remember that a truly exotic panel can significantly increase the price of what would otherwise be a relatively inexpensive airplane. The panel of my Mooney, for example, complete with a Loran, moving map display, DME, dual navcoms and transponders, fuel totalizer, engine analyzer, and digital VOR can cost nearly as much as the rest of the airplane. On the other hand, a moderately full panel of older but workable radios shouldn't hike the price disproportionately. If this is your first airplane, though, and you don't plan any hard IFR flying, you might consider living with a single navcom and carry a handheld as a backup. You'll need to add a transponder and encoder if you fly near a TCA, but for many pilots, a single high-quality 720-200 VHF unit can serve very well and keep from elevating purchase price artificially. This Cherokee 140 panel has two navcoms and a transponder. Plenty of radios to start with. We'll have more to say about avionics later in the show. Let's say you have a set amount of money to spend and you're uncertain whether to go for a relatively late model, low performance airplane or an older high performance fixer upper. While there's no way we can predict your specific needs, our best general recommendation is to stick with the newer model and plan to work your way up to a higher performance airplane later. Unless you're an A&E mechanic who'd rather tinker than fly, the cost to renovate an airplane can be oppressive and downtime can be extreme. Quality paint jobs run $3,500, reupholstery jobs run just about the same figure, and engine overhauls usually start at $10,000. Better to buy a newer airplane, such as this Piper Warrior, with fewer potential mechanical problems. There may be slightly more depreciation on a newer aircraft, but on today's rapidly appreciating used plane market, that may not be much of a factor. The question is, how do you find the best used airplane for the money? While there's no simple answer, we can give you some guidelines, things to look for in finding the best used airplane for you. The process can be broken down into nine main phases, and we'll deal with them one at a time. First, finding the airplane. Where do you look for a good choice of used airplanes? Second, making the preliminary inspection. You often can eliminate many airplanes from consideration with a quick but thorough inspection of a few key items. Third, checking the log books. With a few exceptions, an aircraft's logs give a fairly comprehensive history of its maintenance and damage history. Fourth, the secondary inspection. 
If the first inspection in the logbooks check out, it's time to make a more in-depth examination of the aircraft. Fifth, flying the flight test. If you've gotten this far, now is the time to see how well the aircraft flies. Sixth, performing the final inspection. Things are becoming serious now, and it's time to bring in expert help in the form of a professional A&E mechanic to research airworthiness directives and evaluate those areas you may not be qualified to judge. Seventh, researching the title. Title search is absolutely mandatory on a used aircraft, as there may be liens in existence that you'll be required to pay off before you buy the airplane. Eighth, insuring your airplane. Depending on your experience and the type of aircraft you're considering, insurance can be a major factor in your purchase decision. Finally, ninth, striking a deal. How should you negotiate on what may be the second most expensive item you'll ever buy? After you've zeroed in on the model that best suits your needs, you'll have two choices in purchasing a used aircraft, dealers or private parties. Dealers offer the obvious advantage of greater selection and sometimes a limited warranty at the cost of frequently higher prices. You can find used plane listings in a variety of locations, trade a plane, local newspaper classified sections, a variety of aviation magazines, special advertiser publications dedicated strictly to used aircraft sales, and finally, probably one of the most convenient places, the local airport bulletin board. Ads will answer many questions, but not all of them. An ad typically will define an airplane's total time since new, engine time since major overhaul, avionics installed, special modifications, and occasionally price. What an ad normally won't tell you is how an aircraft has been treated during its service life, and that could be the most important factor of all. The method of selecting the right airplane will depend largely on an organized inspection process and your powers of observation once you find a viable purchase candidate. If the airplane is hangered, that's a definite plus, especially if it looks as if it's always been hangered. Storing an airplane indoors out of the weather tends to minimize corrosion, helps paint jobs and interiors last longer, and generally contributes to lower maintenance costs. Similarly, airplanes that have lived most of their lives in the dry desert air of the southwestern U.S. are less liable to have corrosion problems. Your initial walk-around inspection should be brief but thorough, probably no longer than about five minutes. As you walk up to the airplane, take careful note of the condition of paint and interior Look under the wings, engine cowl, and belly for any fuel, oil, or hydraulic leaks. Fuel stains are typically dark green and will collect near sump drains. Engine oil will nearly always be black and may trail back from the cowling. And hydraulic stains may be a slight reddish color, often concentrated around the landing gear actuators and brakes. On all metal airplanes, check for evidence of corrosion, sometimes in the form of bubbles under the paint. Look for loose rivets and any wrinkles in the skin that may be tip-offs to damage history. On airplanes with fiberglass wingtips, fairings, or wheel pants, be sure to check for crazing, cracks, or warpage in the fiberglass material. Check inside the airplane to determine the condition of the upholstery and panel. Make sure the avionics listed are installed. At this stage, you won't be removing the cowling or inspection plates, but an owner who's fairly meticulous about his airplane's appearance is likely to be picky about mechanical condition as well. The next logical step in the inspection process is an examination of the logbooks, reading them in reverse. That is, from the most recent entries to the oldest. If you're considering a 20-year-old airplane, this can be a long process, but it's one that's well worth the effort. Most single-engine general aviation airplanes have a service life of about 5,000 hours, but that can be extended quite a bit by proper maintenance, so don't necessarily assume that high total time is a bad sign. Take special note of all annual inspections, any major repairs, component rework, and any engine overhauls. Later, you'll have a mechanic double check the logs, but for now, you're looking for anything out of the ordinary. Don't be automatically put off by an accident history. 
just as with an automobile, an aircraft that's been damaged and properly repaired can have thousands of hours of useful life remaining. At this stage, you won't need to disassemble anything, probably just as well since you may not be qualified to conduct that kind of inspection, and an aircraft owner or dealer might not let you do it anyway. You'll pretty much have to uncowl the engine to do any serious inspecting, but before you do remove the cowling, check it closely for fit and security. Look for cracks and determine if it lines up properly. Operate the cowl flap through its entire range to make sure it works correctly. If there's a nose gear door, check it for rubbing and chafing. After removing the cowling, turn on the fuel selector, master and boost pump to pressurize the fuel system. Then check for leaks in fuel lines, carburetors, and around injectors. Examine the carburetor heat system to make certain the valve is working properly and that there are no obvious leaks. Check the intake and exhaust manifolds for cracks. Take a close look at the crankcase with an eye toward any irregularities such as oil leaks, cracks, or discoloration. Inspect the magnetos, alternator or generator, and starter for overall security. Then move up to the engine baffling and see if it's still intact. Examine the cylinders themselves for broken fins, missing or loose attach bolts. Look at all electrical fittings and lines, especially the wiring from the mags to both sets of plugs. Examine the battery if it's mounted up front and check for acid accumulation and overall level. Check everything attached to the firewall for security. Engine mounts are especially important, as if they're loose or worn, they can impose loads on the aircraft in flight. Hydraulic reservoirs normally will be mounted on the firewall as well, and you should check for proper level and any obvious leaks. It's what's up front that counts, and the pointy end of the airplane is as good a place as any to start. Most of the time, you won't need to do any disassembly to inspect the prop. Unless you're buying a home-built or an older airplane, the prop will typically be metal. Don't trust a visual inspection. Run your finger along the entire length of the blades, checking for nicks or scratches. The critical area is farthest outboard where the blade is thinnest and most susceptible to structural failure. Any large nick in a blade is cause for concern as it can set up vibrations that may later cause that blade to fail. A prop in poor condition may also be an indication that the airplane has been operated off airports. If the prop is a constant speed, check the hub for any oil leaks, proper safety wiring, and bolt security. Try to wiggle the blade at the tip to see if it moves. It shouldn't. Moving down to the gear, start with the most obvious feature, the tires. Check the rubber for cuts or checking along with flat spots. Try to determine if the owner used any type of rubber preservative on the tires sometimes evidenced by a slight oily residue. If the airplane is fitted with wheel pants, examine them for cracks. Inspect brake lines for cracks or leaks. Cessna's sprung steel gear is fairly maintenance free, but you should still examine it for cracks at the base or any other signs of abuse, since Cessna's often are used as trainers. Look for any wrinkles in the skin adjacent to gear attach points. If you're examining a retractable, check the gear doors for dings or cracks and, on a fixed gear, inspect the attach points into the wings or fuselage for warping. Inspect shock absorbers for any obvious leaks and make sure the oleos aren't bottomed out. Moving on up to the wings, use both your eye and hand to check for any signs of distortion on the top surface, especially on the critical leading edge. Work the fuel caps to make certain they fit securely. Shake the wingtips to gently rock the airplane and determine that there's no play in the wing, a possible suggestion of spar problems. Look under the wings for any evidence of hangar rash. Cycle all wing control surfaces, normally ailerons and flaps, through their full travel and check to see that the ailerons are streamlined when the control stick or yoke is neutral. Check all the hinges for wear and security and verify the integrity and electrical connection of position lights. Examine wing walk material to see that it's still stuck down and won't flap or bulge in flight. Not coincidentally, the fuselage is where the aircraft passenger and baggage doors attach. And that's a good place to start in checking the fuselage. 
Move every door through its full travel to determine that there's no binding and that the hold opens are operating properly. Unsnap the upholstery on the baggage compartment floor and check the bottom surface for wrinkles. Examine the condition of rubber molding or other weatherproofing around all doors and openable windows. Take a close look at all the plexiglass in the airplane for crazing or cracks, keeping in mind that replacing plexiglass can be extremely expensive. Make a close inspection by hand and eye of the outer skin surface for bumps or any other irregularities. Examine all external antennas and lights for security, loose wiring, associated mounting cracks or other irregularities. Finally, inspect any steps for structural integrity. The tail of any airplane is a fairly critical area, and ironically, it's also often the weakest part of an aircraft structure. For that reason, make a careful examination of tail surfaces with special attention given to the elevator, stabilator, or rudder vader. Inspect the control surfaces themselves, trim tabs, and hinge points with great care for any sign of bending loads, chafing, or binding. Determine that every control surface operates through its full travel smoothly and easily. Additionally, check towel rack ILS antennas, ELT antennas, or any other attachment to the tail for security. The undersurface of the tail often is subject to corrosion and undetected damage because of rocks and debris thrown up by the main gear or blown back by the prop. So look underneath the horizontal stabilizer for dings or paint chips. Inside the cabin, there's plenty to do. You'll want to cycle every light on and off and determine that they're all working properly. You'll also want to check the operation of such items as sun visors, curtains, glove boxes, and map pockets. Now is also a good time to check the primary function of all avionics, though you'll do another check later in flight to determine operating capability. Merely turn every black box on, one at a time, to make certain they're all getting power. If there's more than one comm, try a test transmission to the tower on each to see if you're getting out on both sets. Dial in a commercial broadcast station on the ADF and see if the needle comes alive. If you're unfamiliar with radios, have the owner or salesman do the demonstrating. The flight test can be a little tricky for a number of reasons. If you've come this far, you should be interested enough to fly the airplane but the owner may not let you until the cashier's check changes hands. If so, ride in the right seat with care. Remember, you don't know anything about the owner's flying ability. In some cases, that may be exactly why he's selling his airplane. The whole point of the flight test is to do an operational test of every system in the airplane. If you're well organized, it needn't take long, probably a half hour at most. Go through the radios one by one and ascertain that every comm comms and every nav navs as it should. If the airplane is equipped with an autopilot, check all modes of operation. Even if it's the middle of summer, turn on the heater and check all air vents for free and clear operation. When and if you get to fly the airplane, don't do anything dramatic. Fly it through a full range of simple maneuvers, being especially watchful for any glitch of rig or trim. Climb to cruise altitude, set up max cruise power and note the airspeed, temperature, fuel flow and engine temperature and pressure indications. If the airplane has a turbocharger, check it briefly to see if it will deliver full power at high altitude. During the landing, make sure the flaps cycle to full and that the fuel pump works at low power, normally evidenced by a blip in fuel pressure. By now, you should have decided if you're serious about this airplane, and if you are, you should hire a qualified mechanic to make a more in-depth examination. Ideally, you'll want to hire someone who doesn't have a working relationship with the owner, but is familiar with the model in question. In other words, don't hire the owner's personal mechanic. Just find the most qualified mechanic you can and advise him you'd like a comprehensive pre-purchase inspection. On simple airplanes, one alternative is to actually perform an annual inspection of the aircraft, excluding correction of any major problems, of course. That way, should you decide to buy, you'll have a full year until the next annual. Your mechanic will be the expert on exactly what items need to be examined during the inspection, but you should reasonably expect him to perform a compression check, a gear swing if the airplane is retractable, 
and a complete test of every other major system, from controls to environmental systems. He'll also check that all airworthiness directives have been complied with and that all work performed has been properly signed off. If the airplane checks out up to this point, about all that's left to do is have a title search done and strike a deal. Title search is one of the most important aspects of any sale because it will identify any liens filed against the airplane that you may not know about. Researching the title is also one of the easiest things in the world to do. Regardless of whether you're a member of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, AOPA has a title search office in Oklahoma City where the FAA maintains records of aircraft ownership. For $99, AOPA will provide you with a full title search on the aircraft of your choice. Merely call their 800 number at 1-800-872-2672 or write them at Post Office Box 19244, Southwest Station, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73144. Just provide them with an N number, make, model, and serial number plus a credit card number, and they'll research the registration and send you a report in two to three working days. Alternatively, you can contact the FAA directly at Box 25082, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73125, for a list of other bonded companies that can handle title search. Back to you, Bill. Before you strike a deal for the airplane, you should get at least some basic idea of the cost of insuring it. Just as with automobiles, you'll be concerned with two types of insurance, liability and hull. The latter is essentially the equivalent of collision. As you might imagine, considerations such as pilot experience, ratings, time and type, type and value of aircraft, and other factors make defining specific insurance costs almost impossible. We can give you a few rules of thumb, though. Generally, you'll pay a lot less to insure an airplane than a car of comparable value. We asked Avemco, one of the largest insurers of general aviation aircraft, to give us representative rates for a 200-hour private pilot buying a $35,000 Skyhawk or a $35,000 Piper Aero. Liability for both airplanes was about $450 a year. That's for $1 million with a $100,000 limit per person. Typical hull comp coverage would cost about 2% per year for the Skyhawk and 3.75% for the Arrow. The Avemco spokesman was careful to emphasize that both rates would drop dramatically as much as 50%, with more pilot experience, especially in the case of the Piper Arrow. Hey, Matt, how you doing? How are you, John? All right. You look over the aircraft, I see. Yeah, I had a mechanic look it over. Talking price is always tough without specifics. Pretty obviously, we can't presume to tell you how much you can afford to spend or how much to pay for a given airplane. But we can give you some negotiating points. First, befriend an aircraft dealer or other industry professional who has access to the Aircraft Blue Book Price Digest. As the name implies, this often is the starting point for used aircraft prices, and it can give you some basic guidelines as to what a particular airplane may be worth. Better still, the ABPD lays out allowances for high or low engine time, normal avionics, and other option allowances. If the airplane in question is exactly as advertised and the price is firm, you may have little leverage. But if you discover some discrepancies, you might bargain the price down based on the cost of repair. If the annual is nearly expired, this may be another bargaining point. You may be able to negotiate a lower price based on the annual date. As a rule, though, don't strike a deal conditional upon the owner-dealer annualing the airplane unless you choose the mechanic and make certain the annual is properly performed. Like thousands of other pilots, Dave Jackson of Garden Grove, California, rented for several years before finally deciding to buy. Dave, tell me a little about your flying. Is it mostly business or primarily pleasure? Well, most of my flying really is for business, and uh, I do pleasure trips on weekends. I go for the $100 hamburger and that sort of thing on Saturdays with my family. But most of my flying is for business. Dave, when you finally did decide to buy an aircraft, what airplanes and price range did you consider, and how did you finally decide on the airplane you wind up buying? Well, uh, at first I wanted to buy a retractable airplane because every pilot would like to have that. And I looked at the prices and decided that the cost would be just a little bit high because I'd have to finance, and I thought it'd be better to pay cash for the airplane. That way I'd have money for maintenance and any incidentals I would need to get. 
So I looked at an older Cherokee and the 172s, and the 172s were a little more expensive than the Cherokee. So I found this Cherokee for $12,500, and it has almost the performance of the 172. So I think this was the better deal. Buying a used airplane has been the subject of numerous books. And here are just a few we used as references in preparing the material we presented in this video. The aviation consumer guides are the best, most objective ones we know, comparing the relative merits of individual airplanes. Unlike most other problems you'll face in aviation, buying a used airplane isn't necessarily a scientific process. It involves a combination of experience and street smarts. Still, there's little question whether your mission is business or pleasure, whether your flying is for fun or profit. A used airplane very well may be the best investment you'll ever make, not only in terms of dollars, but also to expand your weekend and vacation horizons. Owning an airplane brings a whole new dimension to vacation and business travel. And any pilot who hasn't tried it simply doesn't know what he's missing. Traffic point turning final three three full stop landing.